Oh, art is my God. I'll, I'll say that. If, if, if there's any deity I worship, it's art. The same way Jesus used to permeate every facet of my existence. I mean, you know, when you're in the, you know, when you're in the uh, mindset of Christianity, every decision you make is ruled or is steered by, you know, that um, orthodoxy of what you're taught, you know, in the church and, and through the Bible. And um, once you get out of the church, My name is Albert Yard. My birth name is Albert. I was born in the Pulaski section of Pulaski Town, section of Germantown in Philadelphia, PA. I am a visual artist. Um, I draw, I paint, um, I write. I write poet, poetry. I, short stories, and recently I've gotten into fashion design. So I, um, I'm a creative, I'll put it that way. I like to say that, I'm a creative. Um, I, I thought I started um, drawing at the age of five, and my father to this day still has a porcelain, porcelain plate that um, I went to John B. Kelly um, Elementary School, and he had us draw while we were in kindergarten on this plate. And to this day, he still has this plate with these trains. And I thought I started at five years old, because that's what um, you know, kindergarten you know, is. But I, I recently found a picture of myself at, in 1974, where I was two. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, how long have I been? He said, nah, you've been drawing since you came out the womb, so, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I didn't know that, but he, he let me know that recently. Um, I was raised in the shadow of the Pulaski Projects, right on um, Coulter Street, 416, West Coulter Street. Uh, it's kind of funny, the dynamic, because um, my mother, she's a born again, you know, Christian believer, and actually she's a pastor now. Um, but my dad, you know, you know he's, I don't wanna say he's atheist, uh, I would say he's agnostic, where, you know, he, just, he doesn't believe any man-made religions, but he knows there's something out there that, you know, started everything we see, you know what I'm saying? I think I get my taste, a lot of my um, music taste, which I used to reject. I used to rebel against um, classical music. I used to rebel against um, jazz music. But my dad always had that playing in the house, jazz and classical. And I, I also say I got um, a lot of my music taste, my palate, from my oldest sister Candace too. My sister Candace, she um, like Parliament Funkadelic back in the 70s. She, she even had Elvis records, you know what I'm saying? Anything that sounds good, so this is why I believe there's only two types of music, good and bad. I don't believe, you know what I'm saying? I, I like anything from folk music to hip hop, to punk, you know, metal, whatever. If it sounds good, if it's good music, I like it. So um, I really don't have a taste when it comes to music, or I don't have an ethnicity, you know, black music, you know, Caucasian music, no, I don't believe in that. I believe it's just good or bad music. Um, it, it was a, like again, it was a funny dynamic because we went to church on Sunday, dad didn't go, you know what I'm saying? We went and um, all my life, my dad has always been shooting questions at me about uh, my philosophy at the time, you know what I'm saying? He would ask me questions like, son, like, what came first? Did, no, he would say, did uh, God create man or did man create God? Now this is the things my father's asking me this since I was about maybe nine and 10 years old. He's shooting these questions off my head, you know what I'm saying? So I've always had, you know, questions about organized religions, or, or the one I was in, basically, um, and that's uh, Christianity, you know what I'm saying? And um, we, we had a really good household, you know what I'm saying? I, I believe, I really think we had a great household. My um, father's father was a millionaire. He had more than 50 homes in Salisbury, Maryland. He had a beach house 
in a place, in a, back then it was a um, gated community called Ocean Pines. I don't know how it is now, but he had a beach house. He had three boats. Um, I remember going on one of his collections when, um, when I was down there for like two weeks. We go down there maybe a month or two weeks out of the summer. And I remember he had a, a duffel bag full of money, you know, after he made his collections. My mother on the other side, her father was a farmer. And while my dad's father was from Salisbury, my mother's father is from um, near the DC area of um, Maryland, Brandywine, Maryland. And you know, he, we would come to the house. This is my dynamic, my family dynamic. I was a very privileged child, I believe that. Because on one side, my father's father was a millionaire. And my mom's father, it seemed, he looked like a millionaire because he had cows, he had pigs, he had chickens. I mean, in fact, you drive up to his house and like you're greeted by, by, by farm animals, you know what I'm saying? It was, you know, special, you know what I'm saying? It really was a, it was a good upbringing. I could definitely say that. I could, if I chose to do anything wayward or off, you know, out of pocket, I couldn't blame my parents or the upbringing because I really had a, I really had a really privileged childhood. I believe that. I really believe that. So that's how things started for me. You know, early... I um, started drawing with pencil, but I don't know what, what it was about the pencil that, I don't know. I, I don't know if I like the texture of it. I don't know how it feels on paper through my, I don't know, maybe it's a biorhythm thing. I don't, I don't know. But um, I used to draw with ballpoint pen. I, I always liked it better than pen, like, you know, with Bic or back in the day, you know, the paper mates. Do they still make paper mates today? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But I would draw with paper mates and Bic. But then when I got a Sharpie, I, I'd found heaven. I'd found my heaven. It was smooth. It was pitch black. And I don't know, I think it's that contrast of that black against that white paper. I just love it. And it's so smooth. And my father told me, you know, a lot of people told me you shouldn't draw with um, permanent ink because, you know, you might make a mistake. But I believe that there are no mistakes. And, I, I, and I, what I found in some of my, um, it's all part of the human process, I believe that. And I found in some of my drawings, some of the ones that I've messed up on have turned out to be some of the best ones I've done. Because I, sometimes I follow the mistake. And what I had in mind, or what that mistake, it you know, supersedes what I had in mind and makes the picture or whatever I was doing better. But, um, it's funny, my dad told me, he said, the fact that you draw with permanent ink, he said, that puts you, he said, it's a rare time. I didn't, I didn't understand it. And to this day, I don't, you know, bro, oh, I draw with ink, you don't, nah. It's just it's something that just comes to me that I, um, you know, that I, I, it's a preference. And, but he told me, he said, he said, artists would die to have that ability. I, I don't, again, I'm not bragging or anything like that, but this, my father's been telling me that for years. And even um, a brother named Jamar Nicholas, I call him my sensei, because uh, one year my wife, uh, one of my favorite uh, birthday presents she ever got me, it was, um, she got me enrolled in a comic book creation class. My wife did this, you know what I'm saying? This is back in maybe about 2005, I think. And um, Cheltenham High School, which is right outside of Philadelphia, they had adult classes. I don't know if they still have adult classes, but on certain, on Tuesday and Thursdays you would go. And um, Jamar Nicholas is a, um, He's a known, you know, through Philadelphia. He's worked for Marvel. He's worked, you know, he's a comic book artist. And he even told me, I, he said, man, in the fact, you, you draw with ink. That's, you know what I'm saying? He said, he even, I, I asked him about it. I said, is that going to be a problem? He said, no, if, that's, if that works for you, do it. And it's, it's funny, I took some, I also took, I didn't take many classes, but my father, um, my mom got me a class at um, Tyler, which is right in, over in, um, what part is that? Elkins Park. That was a part of Temple University, Tyler School of Art. And they had me using a pencil again. And my dad saw it. And he said, uh-uh, no way. I don't, want, I don't want you doing that. You know what I'm saying? I don't want you to lose what you have as far as being able to draw with that ink. My dad was very, you know, he's vehement about that. No, 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 no. I don't want you to do that. And, um, and another thing I, I found out as far as um, how I draw no, first of all, I've got not criticism, but try to be, you know, instructional saying, you know, you should use the pencil because if you mess up. And also, I've been told I draw backwards because a lot of times when people draw a face, they draw the head first and then they fill in the, eye, the features. I don't do that. I draw the eyes first. I feel like if you get someone's eyes, you've captured that person. So I draw the eyes first, draw the nose and the mouth, and then I draw the head around. And I was told by many people that I draw backwards, but... I mean, 
my results. I mean, people told me they love my results. So, you know, that's, I'm frozen for a second. <laughs> I'm stuck. You want to edit this? <laughs> no, it's, I'm trying to think what else. It's, oh, and another thing, my, my, another thing, my dad didn't want me. He told me, and this is no, no disrespect to anyone who's going through art school. He said he didn't want me to be a carbon copy. Like they make these artists that they put on these conveyor belts and they all come out the same way. And, that, and that, that's one of the reasons why I've taught drawing classes. The first thing I tell every kid who comes into my drawing class, or adult, I said, I'm not here to teach you how to draw. And sometimes they're blown away by that. What do you mean? I said, I'm not here to teach you how to draw. I said, because if I teach you how to draw, you're gonna draw like me. And I don't want that. I want you to be the best you. That which makes you uniquely you. I want you to draw like you. I may teach some tips like, how to draw in perspective, um, coloring tips as far as blending colors, um, shadowing, and things like that, maybe two-point perspective and things like that. But I do not teach people how to draw, because I believe uh, if you do that, I don't want them to draw like me. I want you to draw like you, be you, be uniquely you. I believe my earliest influences, and I, I believe this might be true. You know what, I don't wanna, um, say for everybody, but I think for most people, I think their earliest influences come from what they see, you know, within the home. That's just me, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just speaking for myself in this one. Uh, my father was my earliest influence. I used to see, he, my father used to draw. I remember he drew like this spaceship, it just it blew me away. I don't know how old I was at the time, but early on it was my father, um, Especially, again, I already said about my sister when it came to the, you know, the music, but also some of the art on these album covers that my sister had, like those Parliament Funkadelic, um, those album covers were unbelievable. You know, the art that was on there. I think um, one with Pedro Bell, and uh, it was those album covers were so outstanding. She had this one um, album, I think, uh, not, not the Motor Booty Affair, but everything's underwater. It's like, it's, first you got this big ship that's going underwater and you open it up and it was like a pop-up, the album. <laughs> George Clinton was on some shit back then, don't get me wrong. The album was a pop-up, you know what I'm saying? I used to like sneak in and grab my sister's album just to open it up and look at it, get in trouble. Um, but um, comic books, of course. My sister had a nice comic, comic book collection, which I couldn't touch either. And I always used to sneak off and, you know, just to look at them. I remember one, the first comic book that really blew me away by the color of it. It was, um, and I remember it was 1977, so I had to be about five years old. It was Miss Marvel, number one, Marvel Comics, Miss Marvel, number one. And it looked like it was all pretty much um, primary colors, red, blue. And the, the way Marvel Comics was doing those, those, color, those, com those covers in the 70s, that, that color just hit you, you know what I'm saying? It just it blew me away. And I said, I, I, I wanna do that, I wanna you know, draw some my own heroes and things like that. So Stan Lee, of course, Stan Lee was a big early influence. Jack Kirby, who they called a king because, you know, the way he drew. Um, I like uh, John Ramita Jr., uh, John Bashima, Sal Bashima. Um, early on, these were the guys, uh, even Steve Ditko, because Marvel used to run these um, comics where they repeated, they, they reprinted old comics, so you got to, see, even at my age, you got to see some of the ones that were printed from the 60s. They were, they were reselling them, you know what I'm saying? So, but also, then you go to school and there's Dr. Seuss, you know what I'm saying, the way he drew and the way he wrote things. I think I got my love of rhyme from Dr. Seuss, you know what I'm saying? Could you, would you, with a mouse, could you, would you in a house, you know what I'm saying? I think I got my love of rhyme from Dr. Seuss. Judy Bloom, um, Blubber, we used to read that just to see the cuss words. Oh, you know, she got, she got pussy in her book, you know what I'm saying? We, we're in fifth grade, you know what I'm saying? She, does, it, does it say pussy? You know, she got cuss words in the book. It's, it's, we don't know it's about a girl, you know, getting her period, you know what I'm saying? We're just looking for the cuss words, you know what I'm saying? But also, um, Judy Bloom, uh, uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, and the second one was called Super Fudge. Um, Mrs. Nelson is Missing. These, these books when we were growing up, you know what I'm saying? I remember them, you know, Miss Viola Swamp was the evil, substitute teacher who came in, you know what I'm saying? And it turned out that she was actually um, Miss Nelson. Miss Nelson had this costume in the, in the back of her, uh, her um, closet at the end of the book. You see her, her the wig and everything. So Miss Nelson did that to get these kids to be good because these kids were badass kids. Um, 
what I, I remember these books, these, these pictures, like um, the five Chinese brothers, um, Tiki Tiki Timbo, No Sir Rimbo, Chali Chali Bucci, Pip Berry Pimbo. That was the name of a book, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why do mosquitoes buzz? I, I know why mosquitoes buzz in people's ears. That was the first time I ever saw anything that looked, it looked so African. That book is called Why, I Know Why Mosquitoes Buzz in People's Ears. And then you see Bas, I think you can see Basquiat stuff. He must, he must have got it from, I don't know if he was influenced by that, but you see like a lot of African, looks like a lot of African mask, the way they drew, it looked cubic. You know what I'm saying? So um, those, those, yeah, this, I think, you know, again, it starts in the home, what you have in the home. And, and again, I, I will say this, my dad and my big sister Candace were my earliest influences. They really were. And um, then you get to school and, you know, there's other things that you're, you know, made, you know, you're exposed to. And, you know, those, those authors back then, I used to read Encyclopedia Brown, the boy, the kid detective and things like that, and the drawings, they captivated me. You know what I'm saying? So th I'll say those were my earliest, as far as like creating illustrations and drawings, those were probably my earliest influences, without a doubt. Oh, art is my God. I'll, I'll say that. If, if, if there's any deity I worship, it's art. The same way Jesus used to permeate every facet of my existence. I mean, you know, when you're in the, you know, when you're in the uh, mindset of Christianity, every decision you make is ruled or is steered by, you know, that um, orthodoxy of what you're taught, you know, in the church and, and through the Bible. And um, once you get out of the church, your art, my, well, I'll, I'll speak for myself, my art, it flowered. It, 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 it was like a big bang explosion. Because now, when I see a nude woman who I want to paint or draw, I don't have in the back of my mind, oh, Jesus don't like that. Don't do that. You know what I'm saying? Or, if, you know what I'm saying? I, I do whatever I want to do now, artistically. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, my, my process has changed almost, it's, it's been a drastic change once I got out of um, that man-made, you know, man-made organized religions, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that definitely was a um, bridle, you know, they put those over horses to keep them, you know, racing in one direction. They put those bridles, and that's what um, religion was for me. But now the bridles are off, you know what I'm saying? So anything I see can be... Um, and, you know, can inspire me artistically. You know what I'm saying? And I, just like this exit sign over here, you know, the green, you know, almost fluorescent glow of it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, saw, I saw a um, documentary. Uh, was it Monet or Monet? He was still alive. And um, he was saying, what do you see first when you look, when you look at, um, he held up some flowers. It's the color. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times, you know, you see things, I see things in color. That's why I like to use primary colors a lot whenever I'm um, drawing or painting. But um, yeah, my um, whole experience and my uh, whole, um, not technique, my method, but um, the idea of why I do things now, it just totally changed because again, I don't have that, uh, that harness or that chain, you know, putting a cap. It used to cap, put a lid on my um, creativity. You know what I'm saying? Now that that cap is just like the universe is. You know what I'm saying? The universe, science says that the universe is, um, it's endless, it um, has no edges in space, and it's expanding. Now with the, um, with the uh, discovery of this stuff they call uh, dark matter, they said that the universe is actually expanding rapidly. And I feel like we as children of the universe, you know what I'm saying, we should be doing the same thing. You should be evolving. You should be expanding, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, I feel that religion, it, it puts a cap on your evolution, on, on, on your expansion. You, you know what I'm saying? So I can definitely say since, since I've left the church that I'm a totally different, I'm a much, I would say much better, absolutely a much better artist since I've left the church. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I, I, it, it, this is a funny thing. Um, one of my mentors, 
you know, James M. Tume, that, that M. Tume, Juicy Fruit M. Tume. That's, I've been to his house, many, I've met him many times. He, he's, he's a mentor, we call him Mr. M. I met him through um, the rapper, one of my brothers, oh, Henny Savant, he introduced me to him. And um, he said, um, brother, we all start in the church. And I, I really, I'm thinking about every musician, and I think that might be true. <laughs> he said, we all start in the church. And I think that may be true. And early on you're taught that, um, that we have, you know, there's this God who um, rules everything. He's loving. He loves you more than your parents do. He loves you more than yourself. And then you start, when you get older, things just start to, you start to question things. Like I remember during a, we, I went, um, when I went to um, John B. Kelly Elementary School, we went to the Museum of Natural Sciences right downtown. I think it's right off the 17th Street, or 19th Street, I believe. And you go inside, and the first thing you see is the Tyrannosaur model. All the bones were, just were es excavated from some site, but the entire scale of the Tyrannosaur is there. And you don't see anything mentioned about the, the dinosaurs in the Bible. And according to what we're taught in science class, the dinosaurs came before men. So you ask that question. You're in, you're in Sunday school or you're in Bible study and you don't get any answers. You know what I'm saying? That I told you before earlier, my father, <laughs> he said, you know, he would ask me, he said, he said, son, he said, let me ask you a question. When you were growing up in a household, did anybody ever to tell you you had a father, you had a mother, you had, you had um, brothers and sisters? I said, no. He said, well, why do you have to learn about God? I said, what do you mean by that? He said, son, what is, is. You understand what I'm saying? He said, you don't have to really, you know, he said, what is, just is. And what turned things around for me, the, I remember the first thing that had me thinking that this might not be right. Um, not just these little questions, because those questions, they were never not enough to get me out of the um, profession of my faith, of Christ being, you know, my savior. But um, my oldest sister, she's, she's, she's gay. And when she came out, I saw how the church responded to that. And I'm not going to say exactly how, or I'm just going to say, I saw the response. It wasn't the best response. Well, it wasn't a good response at all. I'm, I'm going to say it. Never mind. It was not a good response. But that was one of the first things that made me think that maybe this thing might not be right. Because my family, who was in the church, was instructed to, you don't want that in your household. You don't want, it, it's, 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 you don't want that around the baby niece, who my niece was a baby at the time and things like that. So you don't, you know, my mom, I remember my mom taking my sister's keys from her, from the house saying, I want my keys and everything. And I remember sitting back, I was quiet, just observing what was happening. And I said, to her, that, that, that can't be right. So I remember that maybe a day or two later, I called my sister up, I was working at the downtown Sheraton, which is now the um, Wyndham Plaza Hotel. I mean, which was the Wyndham Plaza Hotel, which is now the downtown Sheraton. And I called her up during my lunch. I said, Candace, come on down, I need to talk to you. And I told her, listen, I don't care what people are saying about you. You're my sister and I love you. So you can be around me or you want, I don't care, hug, kiss me, I don't care, you're my sister. That was one of the things that started getting my mind to start thinking about other things. The, the one that really did it, I met a brother while working at the downtown Sh um, Sheraton. Um, this brother, was he started talk talking to me about the um, Egyptian Book of the Dead. He said, don't you know there were books written before the Bible, you know, that were, you know, that, that were about human behavior as far as like giving men laws? And so I said, you know, I'm not taught this, in, you know, in, in the black jersey, you know what I'm saying? I said, what, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. He said, look up the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And he said, look at the 48 laws of confession. He said, whoever compiled, you know, the Ten Commandments, they clearly got those Ten Commandments from the 48 laws of confession. So I started looking at that and I saw that and said, if you see that isn't what you thought it was, then you're thinking, how much more? You know what I'm saying? How much has, you know, what, what did, um, uh, not Neo, uh, Morpheus say? You see, you want to see just how far the rabbit hole goes down. You know what I'm saying? So then I started digging and then that took me to Africa, took me back home. You know what I'm saying? And when I say home, I mean the home of humanity. You know what I'm saying? Because everyone on this planet, all of our beginnings start right there in the Nile Valley civilization in Africa, in Kemet, you know what I'm saying, which is now called Egypt by the Greeks, you know what I'm saying, so we call it Egypt. And you learn where all these things, all these ideas of a 
Superman, a man born, you know, of a virgin and a man who died and resurrects, who was, you know, can do all these, it all started right there in that Nile Valley civilization. And then, then you, you're there and you kind of outgrow the conscious community. Some, you know, you find out that sometimes they're just as, um, they're almost like the church, you know what I'm saying? My, here's what I've learned. If everybody's saying the same thing, everybody is thinking the same way, I can't be a part of it. You know what I'm saying? I can't be a part of a think tank, you know what I'm saying? Because I have friends who I love, you know what I'm saying? Who we argue views all the time. And that's how it's, I like it like that. If we all thought the same way, if we all spoke and said this, I, I couldn't be a part of it. I couldn't be a part of it. I like the idea that everyone has their own thoughts, their own ideas, and we like to bounce them off each other. What I learn, and I, and I don't want people to think I'm trying to attack their faith, but here's what I've learned. Most people are what they are because of the way they were raised. If I was raised in Southeast Asia, I might be a Buddhist. If I was raised in India, I might be, you know, practice Hindu or, you know, um, be a Hare Krishna. If I was raised in that Arabian Peninsula, I might be a Muslim or North Africa, I might be Muslim. But because I was raised here in the United States of America, which is a predominantly Christian nation, and I am, you know, some of my people are descendants of slaves, a lot of us, and we were taught that by our slave masters. That's why I was a Christian. And let me tell you something. Getting out of your, um, out of whatever you were raised in as far as your, your, your faith, it's almost a miracle. It's almost a miracle. And I, I, you know, thank the universe for what I call, is, this is very difficult, absolute objectivity, that's very difficult to come by. And here's why. Most people are going to see the world how they were raised. Most people see the world through their cultural lens, their cultural incubator, and you can't tell them nothing. My mom said it was like this. That's how it is. My pastor says like this. That's a, they will not even look in the other direction to see something that's different. Absolute objectivity, which is, I'm, I'm a part of an um, a arts movement called Hip Bop. We made, my brother O'Henny, he he created it, and you know me, I'm, I'm over the arts, me and my brother um, Blue Robin, we're over the arts section of it. And we created certain principles, and objectivity is one of our principles. Because we believe, let's hear new ideas, let's listen to this new idea, even if it's totally foreign to us, let's hear what the guy had to say, it may make sense to us, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and another thing, nobody wants to be wrong about anything. I think that's the human ego, you know what I'm saying? I like being wrong. Because if I'm wrong, maybe you can tell me something and put me back on that right track. My ego isn't so big. If I'm wrong, let me, let me hear what you have to say about this subject matter. And if I listen, I listen, you may have some ideas or some, make some valid points that make me change my mind on certain things. So I don't, I love that. But objectivity is so hard to come by because most people are going to see things from their own cultural view and they're not going to change. And another thing I've learned, the more you learn, the more you study, because here's the thing, here's what, got, here's what got me out of Christianity. I started studying it. I actually started studying it, the history of it, who wrote it, what year this was done, do you know what I'm saying? The ecumenical councils, which form what the gospel is today. I, I don't remember how many, ec, ec, how many ecumenical councils there were. I the Council of Nicaea, the Council of um, Ephesus, the Council of Jerusalem, the Council of Constantinople. There were six, I know that, but that's... That's, that's why if you read on the back of your program, some people have this in their programs, the Nicene Creed. And that's exactly, this was voted on by a bunch of men deciding on how the new faith, which Constantine wanted to create, and Constantine created this to control his kingdom. <laughs> that's, that's why he created this. Because this Christianity was taken away. He said, okay, I have to, I have to take a, get a hold of this Christianity because it's running through my kingdom. And he did it. Now, let me tell you something. If Constantine was alive today, I really believe people are like, this shit is still working because I'm telling you, he created it to control and run his kingdom. But there was something else. There's another point I wanted to make. Oh, yeah. The more that you study, the more that you learn, the more you look like an absolute crazy person to people who won't even crack a book to see if what you're saying is thus or so. That's one thing I've learned about being in organized religion. The more you study, the more you learn about things, about any subject matter, really, really in anything in life, the more people who, even in your evolution, let me tell you something about your, your personal evolution. You don't owe anybody an explanation for your personal evolution. That's why it's personal. 
And the more you evolve, the more you change, the more you are looked upon as an absolute crazy person to those who aren't going to change shit <laughs> about who they are and what they do. So that's what I've learned about um, that. That was my uh, journey through um, organized religion and mine, of course, being raised in the United States of America. It, Christianity was the organized religion that I was, I was raised up in. And um, let me tell you something. I don't argue these points. I don't, I don't argue with people. Now, if people want to come and ask me a question, I'll do it. Early on, when I first got out of it, I would argue them, but I don't, mm -mm. I don't, I don't argue these points anymore. I don't do it. I tell I, anybody who asks me, I said, I'm a better father than the God of the Bible. I'm, I know that, that the people who hear this, and they'll be like, oh, that's blasphemy. I, I, tell, I, tell my, I remember I told my wife, and this was tough for my wife, because she married me under Christian, you know, Christian principles. You know what I'm saying? So it's tough. So people ask me, how does that work between you and your wife? I said, love. She loved Albert Cordery, and I love her, so that's why it works, you know what I'm saying? But it was tough for her. It was really tough for her, me um, coming out of that mindset. But I told her, you know, what, you know what killed hell for me, this idea of hell? Having kids. Having kids. There is nothing that Layla Renee and Albert III can do that I would think they are worthy of eternal damnation and hellfire, eternal torture. There's nothing those two babies could do. And I told my wife, and I'll tell anybody this, if my kids became serial killers and they put a desert eagle to my temple and said, Dad, I'm going to kill you, and I knew they were going to do it, I still, knowing they're going to blow my brains out, blow my top off, I still would not want my kids to burn for eternity. I would want them to get rehabilitated. I would not want them to burn for eternity. So, And again, if Christianity, were, if, if it works for you, if the organized religion works for you, the universe, bless, that, that's great. I, I'm not here to um, dispute or kill anybody about their faith. You know what I'm saying? If it works for you, it does. But I grew, it, it doesn't work for me anymore. It just, it just doesn't. And that's how, I, you know, that's my uh, take or my history with um, organized religion here in the United States of America. <laughs> it's funny you ask that because I um, absolutely know that visual arts and music are intertwined, that they go hand in hand, which is why I'm a little, I, I tell my dad all the time, because my father can play piano, he can play saxophone, and what else can he play? He can play piano, sax, and the flute. And I'm like, Dad, why didn't you make me play <laughs> an instrument? You know what I'm saying? I know I would have loved it. But, you know, he had a lot of plans for the family, but, you know, divorce kind of, uh, he, he had music plans for the family, but his divorce with my mom kind of messed things up. But um, musically, again, early on, I used to rebel against um, classical and jazz. Now they're like my favorite, <laughs> they're, like, they're like my favorite genres of music. Um, of course, you know, I, I'm always going to have that love for um, hip hop music. Um, I mean, I, I believe I was raised by Public Enemy, Chuck D. <laughs> but then I, I think I always appreciated groups because I was a big fan of um, Public Enemy. Then I became a big fan of um, A Tribe Called Quest. Then I became a big fan of, you know, Wu Tang. You know what I'm saying? I, I, maybe it's multiple voices that made me a fan, but it was, it was really, his was really funny. The thing I used to rebel against so much with my dad, I started finding it in hip hop. Like, um, I'm a huge Gangstar fan. Um, Rest well, brother guru, Keith Elam, you know what I'm saying? I'm a huge Gangstar fan. So when I started hearing these jazz samples that they were incorporating with this stuff, I'm like, oh boy. My dad said, wait a second, what are you listening to? Do you know that's Night in Tunisia? I'm like, yes, dad, you know what I'm saying? So he said, so what, what, who, what rapper is that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My dad was here. And um, I, when Guru, you know, of course they had they infused that, and so did a tribe called Quest. They infused jazz samples into the into their music too, and it actually brought me back. It was almost like a, a cyclical thing, you know what I'm saying? Where it started with my dad, I tried to go away from it, but hip hop brought me back to, to you know to um, this love I have for jazz music. My favorite musician of all time is Miles Davis, and the reason why I love Miles so much because he did not have a cap on creativity. This guy, he, he, he would not let himself 
be defined by any thing when it comes to music. In fact, one of his last albums was a hip hop album he did with um, Easy Mo B. People don't know that. Miles has a hip hop album that he did before he passed. So he, 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 he experimented with everything. In fact, a lot of rock people look to Miles because he, he infused certain elements that you know, help bring rock music together. Carl Santana talks about how much he loves Miles, but Miles had no, no cap at all on his um, creativity from you know, taking it from standard to, you know, he was, people don't know, Miles you know, used to be able to do the bebop stuff, which is the most you know, technical and most you know, difficult stuff. And then, you know, he created the, what they called that cool sound, where it wasn't about the amount of notes he was playing, it's about the notes he chose. Like those notes he chose, like, damn. Like, one of my favorite pieces by him is Blue and Green on the um, Kind of Blue album. Most people love um, all blues. You know, dun, 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 dun. But I love this piece on there. My favorite one on there is called Blue and Green. And that album, that song, it, he makes that horn cry. Well, I, I, I'm telling you, I, I did it, that, that piano solo, I did I'm like, I had to stop sometimes, like, God damn, what the hell are they doing on that, on that, that, that piece? But, um, and, and really, it's funny, when I'm drawing, painting, or even writing, I find myself playing either jazz or classical. Like, my favorite singer of all time is Ella Fitzgerald. You know what I'm saying? I love me some Miss Ella. Another, she reminds me of my Nana, too, my dad's mother, um, El, Miss Ella. But I, I play Azure, you know. Um, she does a live performance where she does a medley. And it, ugh, Ella Fitzgerald, that, that lady, unbelievable. You know, you know what I'm saying? She's a true artist. Whereas, you know, on stage, if she would mess up, she could just start scatting and make that thing... You know, Yeah, um, yeah, Miles Davis for me, he he is just he's he's that dude when it comes to creativity, because again he was like the universe. You know what I'm saying? You know, no edges in, in his space. You know what I'm saying? And he expanded to to the end. You know what I'm saying? But um, it's funny what I listen to. I listen to like a, um, not much variety. I might throw some hip hop in there, but when I'm creating, a lot of times it's, it's either classical or jazz. I listen to opera. Maria Callas. I don't know if you saw the, um, the movie Philadelphia. I was introduced to that La Mama Morta from that scene with Denzel, where, where um, you know Tom Hanks is telling Denzel about that piece. It, it moved me so much in the film. I wound up you know making it a part of my creative uh, process. La Mama Morta by Maria Callas. Yeah, this big six foot six, three hundred pound guy is listening to that while he's painting and drawing. I listened to. Um, uh, the Bolero by Ravel, you know, you know, you know well, no, no, actually, I'm, I'm actually doing um, Rhapsody in Blue by, uh, it's actually Rhapsody in Blue by uh, George Gershwin. I listen to that too, but anybody knows who Ravel is, you know, the Bolero. I, I, my favorite classical composer, believe it or not, um, Ricard Wagner, you know what I'm saying? And his stuff sounds so thematic, like that ride of the Volga, dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. You know what I'm saying? It's so the man. I'm a big Ricard Wagner fan. But um, what introduced me to Wagner, my dad, listening to WRTI, um, but also, which is um, a Philadelphia um, classical music station, but also the movie Excalibur. You know, Wagner was playing throughout it. And it's funny how cinema, you know, um, TV and cinema, I've been introduced to different artists even through that. Like one year I was watching um, True uh, Detective. And I heard a Bobby, um, Bobby Blue Bland song, you know, I pity the fool, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I said, that's, wait a second, I, I know Bobby Blue Band, I don't remember that song. And I became, you know, I started listening to that a lot. But I like a lot of old stuff, but there's some new guys doing some things too. Like I, I, I talk about my affiliation with um, Oh Honey Savant. I'll play his stuff, hip bop stuff, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, cause it's so multi-layered and it's so incredible what he's doing. Well, this guy is rapping over horn riffs. <laughs> Guess where I'm from? You know what I'm saying? He's rapping over um, Thelonious Monk songs. And he's actually, you know, he has his voice, which is um, harmonized, his own melody with the horns. You know what I'm saying? I listen to that. Uh, Levine and Rose. Uh, I listen, that, that's um, Louis Armstrong. I, I listen, 
While I'm drawing a pen, you know what I'm These are the type of things I listen to. I love rock music. Everybody, you gotta love Jimmy. You know what I'm saying? I think you, you can't be a rock fan without loving Jimi Hendrix. You know what I'm saying? So he's he's another one of my. If I had a top five favorite musicians, I go Miles first. I say uh, John Coltrane second. And I got people. Listen, we all know how crazy John Coltrane is, but I don't think Alice gets enough credit for how incredible of a musician she is. You know what I'm saying? I recently put up a, um, you know, I, I like to do that in my uploads on, on social media where I'm seen drawing while I'm playing some music in the background. And I recently put up a picture of, um, you know, John Lewis, he um, recently passed. And I played a song by Alice Coltrane called um, Cheerio and Ramakrishna. And that, <sighs> the way her, her fingering on the piano in that song, it's just, it just I, I don't think she gets enough credit because she has some incredible uh, albums and standards that she put out that this is just amazing. But um, then there's times where, you know, I, I might listen to that, that rough metal stuff. Like, I, I was introduced to Black Sabbath because of the Road Warriors. I grew up like in professional wrestling, so Iron Man. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I, I became a fan of metal, listening, you know, watching pro wrestling. So I, I listened to Iron Man or um, Edgar Winter, Frankenstein. Um, you know, Chicago, everybody, it, it, that's why I say it. I, I don't believe that there's a white music or black music or Latino music. If it's good or it's bad, that's the only thing that happens. I, I love Mongo Santa Maria, this guy who plays, you know, he plays, you know, the congas and things. I, I, again, when it comes to, I, I, I see no ethnicity when it comes to music. You're either good or you're bad. And, one of the things that I, I noticed with um, people like me, my, my friends, they call me the Allosaurus. My name is Al. They call me the Allosaurus. They say I'm a dinosaur. But I'm learning that there are guys out now, too, who are great. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times we, we, there's this idea that people today can't create the way that people in the past is, and that's bullshit. It's bullshit. You, the universe is full of potential. It's full of... Um, possibility. There's so much, you know, creativity in the universe that you can't tell me that there's not something new that we can tap into. And that's what I'm looking for with my art. I'm looking for something new that hasn't been done before. So I tell people anyway, I'm a snitch when it comes to the universe. Whatever the universe gives me, I snitch on the universe and then I put it out. You know what I'm saying? So I'm look, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm searching for something new for the, and I'm open to the universe to what it wants to give me in the, in the realm of creativity, in the, be it painting or illustration or whatever, because I, I feel like I haven't found it yet, but I'm looking for it. It's sort of, I've heard um, John Coltrane said that before he did Love Supreme. So I'm looking for my Love Supreme, you know what I'm saying? Um, I think all artists are like that. They're looking for something and it's there. We just have to tap into it. I do not believe this idea that's out there that the people in the past are better than people today. I, I just, I think it's a, it's a level playing field and then we just have to tap in and find, as my mentor again, um, James and Tume says, find the difference in the familiar. Because here's what I tell people, everybody, there's a lot of people who can draw. There's a lot of cats who can draw. There's a lot of cats who can paint. There's a lot of great photographers. A lot, but what sets you, makes you different than them, that makes you desirable? The, you, you understand? Like, here's something, something funny. Well, not funny, but something. My brother, Blue Robin, his name is Blue Robin. We had this saying, well, he said it first. I do portraits of people, but I purposely alter them. You know it's them. When you look at it, it looks just like, but I purposely alter certain things. I exaggerate certain things that maybe I find pronounced. And I do it on purpose because he said something that, that it resonated with me that I, that I made a part of my life. He said, if you wanted to look just like the, pho the photograph, just take a picture. You know what I'm saying? But let the artist put its spin on it, put my, my expression or my um, interpretation of what I'm saying. And I do that whenever I have a portrait. You know it's you, it's gonna look like you, but I'm gonna add some flair or add some things to it. Because again, we want, you know, I don't want it to look exactly like the picture. I, I, I mean, some people do that 
It's great. And again, I say that. Some, pe- there are a lot of people who can draw, paint, whatever. What makes you different? It's like, that's what made, what made Basquiat different. Basquiat could draw. I've seen his sketches. This guy could draw the human body, anatomy, and everything. But when he tapped into his childhood, when I saw that he was a, a, you know, approaching that, um, those canvases like a, a, a kindergartner, well, that's when he, boom, there, there was an ex, that explosion. Same thing with Picasso. Picasso could paint regular things like that, but when he started doing that African cubism, you know, he obviously looked at the African mask and things like that, which were a lot simpler. They weren't as detailed as this stuff when he was drawing, you know, the human body and painting the human body. When he tapped into those things, that, that difference, see what I'm saying? That's what really, you know, boom. I, I, I tell everybody, um, it's not really about how great, you know, as far as the um, proportions or the detail or whatever. It's the idea behind the painting. It's not just the technical ability behind the painting. It's the idea, what's the, what's the thought process behind it? And I know that with, with a lot of my art, I put a lot of esoteric and exoteric little hidden and things that I hide in broad daylight in, in, in public, public view. I do that on purpose to make it different. Because it's not, again, it's not just about the technical thing because being technically great is wonderful. It's great to be technically proficient. But if what you do doesn't move me. I don't care, I don't care how well you play the, play the piano. I don't care how, how, how well you blow a horn. I don't care how well you draw or paint. If what I see doesn't move me or what I hear, there's, there's a great story I heard about um, a Russian grandmaster pianist went to see this young prodigy play the piano. This kid played the piano upside down, backwards, without looking and things like that. And the grandmaster told him, listen, you play the piano well. One day you'll learn how to play music. And that was that, that's so profound with me. I don't want to just be able to draw or just, you know, I want to be able to create great, emotional, moving, stirring images, stirring art. It's more than just a technical thing. Bruce Lee said that too. Bruce Lee said this. And believe it or not, I used to incorporate this in my, um, when I used to be, I, remember I used to be, I was, a, I was a preacher when I was in the Christian church. And when, on my way out, I was incorporating some of Bruce Lee's philosophy. Because Bruce Lee said, on one hand, you have technique, that technical ability. And he said, that's great to have that. But if you're too overbearing on that side of it, you're like a robot, a mechanical man. He said, it's great to have just the, um, he said, technique and just spiritual, just the natural ability. That's good, too. But if you, too, if you lean too hard to that, you're undisciplined. You know what I'm saying? He said, what you have to learn to do in whatever you do is to bring the technique and the regular natural ability together so, you know, so it's a, on a level playing field. That's when you get to what, nirvana or what, you know, what they call zen, or, you know what I'm saying? When you reach that area where you're in that zone where you can bring technique and natural ability together. And that's what I'm looking to do. And, and I'm looking for it. Again, I, I, what people said, I'm doing some great stuff. My best stuff is, is ahead of me. I, I feel like I got more ahead of me than behind me when it comes to great works. My process, I'll say this, if, if, I, if it's not a work or a commission work I'm doing, I don't, I think my process is not having a process. I, I've, I've gone to sleep and dreamt, <laughs> inspired, you know what I'm saying, and woken up like, I need to draw this, this, this dream I had, you know what I'm saying? I will say this, a lot of times I do things at night, in the wee hours of the morning, that's one part I would definitely say. I really believe during the day, everybody's pulling on the universe for creativity, for ideas, you know what I'm saying? People on Wall Street want ideas, people, you know, in the banks or in um, corporate America or something, they're pulling on ideas, you know, to get the job done, you know what I'm saying? Asking, they don't realize they're asking the universe for ideas on how to do things. At night, when people are asleep, I think you have more of a clear channel to that creativity because most people sleep, you know what I'm saying? So I think you have a more... There's, not, there's my, not as much interference. I say, I'm, I'm a nocturnal dude. And believe it or not, my 10-year-old son, if he didn't have to go to school, and hopefully when this pandemic is over, he'll be going back to school. My son, like this morning, he went to bed around 7 o'clock this morning. My son <laughs> is up drawing. And he has the gift too. My son is up drawing to the wee hours of night. So that's, one, that's, that's part of my process. I'm, I, am, I am nocturnal. I will definitely say that. But a lot of times, 
And this is why I told people before, I said this in an interview maybe um, 10 years ago. I said, I try to be aware of things that people don't take notice of. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is why I do the speed limit while I'm driving. I feel like if I'm going too fast, I might miss something. You know what I'm saying? Because I am inspired. Like I said, if it's not a commission work, I am inspired by everything. Anything can be inspiring to me. You know what I'm saying? I look, like I said, I said that exit sign. I'm, I'm looking at the, you know, the, this clock look like, there's a clock over here on the wall that looks like it was taken out of like, you know, maybe 1800s. I know they didn't have clocks like that in the 1800s, but it looks so antique and so, you know, crazy. And I'm looking at these, these photos that you have up, the contrast, the black and white, which are amazing. I'm, I am inspired by so many things. So my process usually is I, I get, you know, I, I see something, especially, you, you see the political jokes I do. I, I love doing satire. That's why you see a lot of, if you notice, I do have Trump jokes, but I also have Joe Biden jokes. You know what I'm saying? So you don't, you people ask me, what, what do we believe as far as like um, my political views? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not telling you. Guess. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I diss both sides, you know what I'm saying, in my um, satire. But if Trump says something off the wall, boom, I got him. If Joe Biden says something off the wall, boom, I'm going I'm to draw, I'm going to make a, something comedic about both of them. Like that, that situation where Joe Biden told uh, Shalomar, I mean, I'm Charlemagne the God. He said, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. So, you know, I made, I made a cartoon, a little comic where it says, if you don't vote for Joe Button, uh, Joe Montana, Mighty Joe Young, <laughs> Joe Montana, you ain't black. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I like to do a little something. And when Trump was having his problems coming down the, um, that ramp at um, West Point after the commencements, I made him stumble. And at the end, he lands in a balletic he even has on the, the balletic, you know, shoes and say, I'm fine. And I have judges behind him, get him a seven and a 10 for his landing. You know, I do, you know little things like that. It's current events, current events definitely are part of my process. Because if I see something funny, I'm going to draw it. You know what I'm saying? I, I even make fun of things that are serious. Because sometimes you have to laugh. You have to laugh at stupidity. When you see some dumb stuff like this, um, I didn't, want to try, I didn't want to bring in the Black Lives Matters movement, but um, during some of their, um, their protests, they said they had people who weren't even a part of the protest, the, um, the movement, just destroying things. So I drew a picture of this, um, this uh, Caucasian woman with a Molotov cocktail in her hand saying, fuck the police, kill these motherfuckers, let's burn this motherfucker down. <laughs> and I have a picture of myself, a big picture of myself with a picture that says, you know, it's all about the protest, really what we're, we're, we're trying to fight for. And uh, there's a woman behind me like, uh, Black Lives Matter? <laughs> Looking at her like, uh, like, you know what I'm saying? Just, just current events are a big part of my process. But also the universe gives me some stuff. Sometimes I, I can be sleep. And that's what I'm saying. I, I dream about this stuff, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. Oh, also, nature shows. Anybody knows I have, I have my own comic book universe. It's time for me to do a comic book, you know what I'm saying? But I have so many characters I've created. But I love watching Natural Geographic. And everybody knows my favorite animal on the planet is the shark. You know what I'm saying? And this is Shark Fest. Shark Week is coming up. Uh, it's five weeks of, of sharks of Shark Fest. I, I just, I love sharks, you know what I'm saying? I, I told people, I think it's the simplicity of them. All they do is swim, hunt, and eat. You know what I'm saying? I love sharks. But natural, nature shows, they inspire me. Um, Definitely, just life and life inspires me. That's, that's definitely part of my process. And um, again, I love permanent black ink. I don't know. I, I, when I see a sharpie, I, but I guess some people look at their their tools. As a sharpie is almost an extension of my hand because there's no well, that's the smoothness of it against the paper. There's no friction. There's no traction. It's almost like it glides. It's, it's, it's like it's almost a part of it. That's what I love about that black ink. You know what I'm saying? Because it's just, it's almost like you're ice skating. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, a, it's almost like, I guess, you know, again, it's like an extension of who I am. It's something I'm working on too, as far as um, a painting style, a technique that I'm calling um, seamless transition. And my hand is really flowing. And in fact, I, I did a, um, one of my t-shirts. That was a seamless transition piece. The, um, I called it the police. That was the Edgar Allan Poe t-shirt I did with the, um, the Baltimore City police cap on. A lot of that went over people's heads too. I put, I, took, I posted a picture of myself. Again, some esoteric, exoteric stuff that only I know about. Um, and I put a raven on my shoulder. Anybody knows 
Edgar Allan Poe, you know what I'm saying? He um, wrote the um, poem, The Raven. So that's why on my Poe post, my, my Poe Lee shirt, I had a raven on my shoulder, you know what I'm saying? And people know that um, Edgar Allan Poe lived in Baltimore, so that's why I had a Baltimore City police cap on his head. So that's little things I might hide in, you know, inside of that, inside what I'm doing. But um, my process, I think, I think I've covered everything. I think I, as far as my process goes, as far as um, current events, uh, the universe, just looking into the stars, the, the, the darkness of space, you know what I'm saying? I, I, believe that's, I believe that's my process. Life, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Life, my process. Being a black creative, uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's another funny thing that I've, I've come into. E even that, uh, <laughs> this, this is very controversial. Um, I, I really don't argue over the word black, but there, there, there's a study that I've, I've done, and, I've been, and I'm still going through it, that... Uh, and I challenge other people who hear this to, to listen to this. There's an idea out that black and white are not ethnicities, but they're social statuses. That when you don't um, identify yourself with a land or a nationality, you are then labeled, you know, as far as melanated people are, as black. And according to the Constitution, black people are not full people. They're three-fifths of a person, according to the Constitution. But here's another thing that's being um, questioned. There's a, a, a thought process, and, and I'm, I'm leaning towards it, that it, it makes sense, that a lot of us were already here before colonization, before the Atlantic slave um, slave um, trade. And here, here, here's, here's where this comes from. Um, Giovanni Verrazano, Verrazano was who the Verrazano Bridge in New York is named after. I read one of his um, memoirs to, I believe it was King George III, I believe. And he wrote this in his memoirs. This is pre-colonial America. He wrote that the people he saw this is when he, 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 he was in the mid-Atlantic area. Mid-Atlantic areas like that, Virginia to North Carolina. He said, the people who I've seen, the natives to this country, are no different than the Ethiopians. And this is before the slave trade. So some of us, some of us did come over in that trade, but many of us did not. And this is a very controversial thing because a lot of us, some of us are Aboriginal, indigenous to this land, not Africa. Now, of course, all, everything starts in Africa. We know that. But at one point, we look at the, we look at the, um, the continents, look at the, look at the globe, look at the globe. I used to, when I was, and I bet you you'll say this, when you were young, didn't you say this is like a big puzzle? Then you start learning about Pangaea, that everything was at once together. And there was a great earthquake and continental drift, which caused everything to spread out. But at one point, we were already, we were already here. In fact, if you look at um, Mexico, if you put it in South America over near Africa, that's the northeast extension of, of, of Africa. And the Moors were here before the colonizers were here. What, the Moors were pitch black Africans. So this... So that, that's controversial. So some people, and, and some people will argue with you, oh, you're saying you ain't black, you know. No, there's a different thought process when you say you're Aboriginal, you're indigenous to this country. Now, some people did come over on a slave trade, they did. But some of us, we were already here. And that's what some people, it's, it's sad, some black people want to hold on to the fact that we were brought over through slavery instead of saying that we were already here. You know what I'm saying? But what does that mean to me? Because I, I look at myself, here I am, I'm a fair, light-skinned 
brother, but I have African Africoid features. I have the thick lips, I have the, the nose, you know what I'm saying? I got a big ass head, you know what I'm saying? Akhenaten, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm proud of this big ass head, you know what I'm saying? But, um, and, and when people look at me of other ethnicities, they say, he's black. So I identify with that, you know what I'm saying? The, people look at me, oh, you're black. And I see my, my, what that means to me. It, it affects, I, I believe it affects your work where you see your people who are melanated people go through a certain treatment here in this country. And it should affect what you do because I, I believe life, art imitates life. Um, I did a large painting, um, it's maybe seven foot tall. I'm sorry about that. And um, I called it Black America. It was a skull with the flag painted on it and blood under the skull, representing our um, experience here in the United States. So sometimes you draw, you paint from anger sometimes. You know what I'm saying? But, and, but what I've learned, me, me being a, uh, I love to laugh. And I love to make other people laugh. I'll take things that could be painful as a melanated black indigenous person and I'll add some comedy to it to you know make it satire you know I know like Mark Twain would do stuff like that you know what I'm saying use satire um Gil Scott Heron would do that he would if you ever saw his live performance he, he was Gil Scott Heron's one of the funniest guys you ever see if you ever saw him live you know what I'm saying so I would do that but what I'm trying to think what, how I could find meaning in this that, what does it mean to me? I feel like, again, that in some aspect, this has to show up in my work. And I feel like, so I do some protest art to, you know, to continue that, um, the struggle that we're going through. And, and, and there's being a, there's a paradigm shift going on right now in this country. And I'm hoping it continues. I'm hoping we don't just go back. A lot of times in the past, we, we get upset, we burn shit down, and then it's, you know, business as usual. You know what I'm saying? I'm guessing, because the way things are going now, because this is unprecedented, you know, the way things are going now, that um, perhaps there will be some change in this country. I'm hoping on the planet, because you saw people over in different countries who were, you know, you know, tearing things up for George Floyd. You know what I'm saying? That, that affected, you know, went, went over, the, over the pond, you know, over in um, different countries. So I'm hoping. That's one thing I used to, I love about Star Trek. That's the one thing, one of the very things I love about Star Trek. Because it's a world, it's an earth, it's an existence where there are these stupid things like um, ethnicity. They don't matter. They don't matter. They're, they're irrelevant. There is no hunger, which is so stupid anyway. In the United States, it, it, this is one of no one on the planet should be hungry in the United States. How the fuck do you have a country that where gluttony is a problem and so is and so is starvation? What that shows how it's, it's just stupid. You know what I'm saying? That no one on the planet there's so many resources and so many rich people to make sure nobody on this planet should be starving. But I, I feel I'm, I'm compelled to protest to you know to speak out, not verbally, not, not orally, but through the paintbrush, maybe through something I write. I, I, I do short poems, I've done, I've done one on, I've done some on, online, you can see them, and um, like the ancestral line of question, and that was towards us as a people, when I say our acts today have looked away. You know what I'm saying, my God, what have we learned? You know what I'm saying, that's, that's, that's for us, like the things that we're doing today, like you know, we're so far removed from what we were in Kemet, you know what I'm saying? So what's going on with us? But I feel that's what it means to me to be, to be a melanated, you know, a, a black artist that I'm compelled to be a voice, to um, be a voice of change and, and for, for my people. Believe it or not, even though this is my passion, my ultimate goal is for the you know enlightenment and for the uh, freeing of, of our people. You know what I'm saying to to and better the lives of melanated people. That that's that's my ultimate goal. You know I'd love to be you know be able to do some things through the arts that can make lives better for our people. And and I really had a, had a, my own par paradigm shift recently working at you know the Glen Mills School for um you know um 
troubled youth. And I didn't realize the state. I mean, I, you, you watch the news, you get an idea of what's going on with our kids. But when you start working with them, then you, you really see what's going on. I love all those kids. You know what I'm saying? If they watch this, they know. They call me Unc. You know what I'm saying? They, they call me Unc at Glen Mills. I love, my, I love those dudes. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and I said, I, many of them, I wish I could have changed you know, the circumstances they, that had them incarcerated because I, I don't believe in bad kids. I don't, mm -mm. working at Glen Mills, you'll learn. If you really learn and, and, and you love kids, you realize you got problem kids, kids with problems. Not, they're all born with clean slates, all trying to make it. And nobody's perfect. And I say that about myself. You know, <laughs> I know we, we didn't bring this up. But I, I tell everybody, I got, I got to shout out my wife, um, Jackie. Um, because this is what I'm saying about nobody's perfect. Because I believe she was cursed to love me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you're, you're seeing this side of Al. You know what I'm saying? She sees, you know, who I am at home. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I tell everybody all the time, I'm a flawed, a very flawed human being. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm, I'm too busy working on myself to be looking at anybody else's shit. You know what I'm saying? To, to, spine, to shine a light on anybody else. I got too much of myself to be working on. So I'm not trying to change anybody but this guy right here. You know what I'm saying? And, and my wife, she, she puts up with me. You know what I'm saying? And I thank the universe for Jackie. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, I, I think what it means to be a, a melanated or black, whatever, these, these, these are just labels, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not, I'm not concerned or upset with any of them. Um, I feel like, you know, you have to uh, be excellent too at what you do. Yeah, you have to be excellent. There's, there's, there's no place for mediocrity, especially in, a, um, in this country. You know what I'm saying? You have to be above the norm, you have to be exceptional in everything that you do. And, and I hope that's, that's the way I'm going. <laughs>
I'm the shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and you got these masters saying, no, no, I'm still trying to perfect this thing. You know what I'm saying? So I would say that to any young, inspiring artist. You can all, there's always, as Friedrich Nietzsche says, there's higher heights. You know what I'm saying? There's always higher heights. And be you. Be you. Uh, and that's tough to come by. When you're creating and it's, it's all you, um, another thing, I gotta say this again, James M. Tume. He told me, he told us, and, and we had brothers, and he, he talked to us about the three stages of creativity. You go from imitation. Most people, when they start off, they start off trying to sound exactly like the person that inspired them to do what they wanna do. They start, they sound, you know, they got some talent, but they sound just like their favorite singer, writer, draw, whatever. Is it then you go to a stage where you still sound like that person, but you're starting to fuse in your little stuff. It's called emulation. So you go from imitation to emulation. Then the third stage is when you're creating your own stuff, coming up with your own ideas, and it's all you. That's um, inspiration. No, innovation. That's innovation. So you go from Imitation to emulation, emulation to, in, to innovation, where you are creating your own thing. This is all you. And now everything you create is done by you. So let that happen in your life, you know, again. And, and, I, and you see it in life. Um, Hulk Hogan, he, he obviously was watching superstar Billy Graham when he was growing up. You know what I'm saying? And you can see where, you know, in Al Green, he obviously was listening to... Um, why can't I think of his name? I was born by the river. I was born by the river. Sam Cook. It's obvious. Listening to Al Green, he was he was he was definitely um, inspired by Sam Cook. You know what I'm saying? So do that. You know what I'm saying? Let that process happen. And in your way to being, I don't know, having patrons or being, you know, being discovered. Accept help. <laughs> Understand. It's very difficult to do this by yourself. You need help. Come to that conclusion. You're gonna need help to get to where you're going. So if it's offered to you, accept help. Accept it. We, we need it. In fact, the universe, listen, we're all a part of one big unit. That's what the universe is. We're all, I tell, that's why I tell people how it's so beautiful when you start to understand your place in the universe. When I look up into the sky, and this, this, this is the thing that um, organized religion does. It puts your deity so far away, and you're so far, and, and, you know, you're so minuscule, you're so minute, and this great, giant, awesome deity that has all superpower is so, so far away in the heavens. But now, when I look at the stars, knowing that the same elements, and Neil deGrasse Tyson said this, knowing that the same stuff the gaseous elements and everything that are in those stars or in me, they don't seem as distant anymore. I know that the same thing that's in them makes me up. Dirt, <laughs> it may not look like it, but those same minerals and everything, those are the same minerals that are inside of us. We're all connected. So again, you know what I'm saying? So again, so the universe, we're not just in the universe, the universe is inside of us. You know what I'm saying? So I would say, don't think, you know, you're, alone or you can, you know, I'm gonna do this by myself. I accept the help that comes your way. Because you, if you're doing the right, what, what you're supposed to be doing, the universe is gonna send help. Make sure you recognize it and accept it. You know what I'm saying? Everybody makes it with, I don't care how great you are, you have to be discovered in order to make it. You know what I'm saying? So accept that person who's here to discover you or whatever, however they're gonna help you out. I would say that. <laughs>